So this week, um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to start jumping into the assembly crash course. So um, I know that uh, for a lot of the folks uh, that are in the graduate program, um, assembly language is not necessarily a uh, um, you know a system that's taught uh, as much at the undergrad level anymore. Um, if you took a computer engineering or electrical engineering, you probably did run into it. But um, if you took a uh, computer science or um, uh, information technology or something like that, you may not have run into assembly language. Uh, that said, you will run into a lot of assembly language when doing malware analysis. Um, we will stick to the machine architecture that's most of these uh, PCs. Um, but I will say that uh, you are going to probably run into uh, other uh, assembly variants as well, including uh, the one uh, assembly for like the ARM processors, so your Android um, devices uh, and any of the other embedded devices. Um, there will be some other very application specific processors you run into if you get hired by a company um, that does a lot of ICS work and is very interested in ICS, uh, uh, ICS malware, industrial control systems uh, targeted malware. Uh, so companies, you know, of course that do that, that are local. Uh, Siemens being a uh, big one, and then uh, a number of others as well, but they're the ones I believe are in the news. Uh, so I'll put them out there. I know they do a lot of great work and uh, research in that space here. So, so we'll get started off. Um, those of you who have programmed C, C++, um, and even have done like microsystems programming, this lecture is going to be uh, mostly just uh, rehashing something you already know. But um, for everyone else, um, one of the key things to recognize here is um, the top the top sentence. Uh, in order to execute software on most of your systems, most of your environments, the source code or the code, you just say that, uh, for whatever software you're trying to run, must be converted into machine language at some level or in some fashion. Uh, so what I'm basically saying here is that in, in order for me to be able to like move the mouse around here, control everything, um, present this to you, oh, I'm being told that no one can hear me. Give me one second and uh, Okay, let me see if I can do it over here. I might be able to do this. 
Okay, can you hear me now on the... Okay, thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, uh, for those of you who are on here, I don't know why, but it, um, WebEx acted differently this time when I connected. So uh, audio is working. I do not know if, let me see, there's the camera. So the camera might be working now, maybe. So now, uh, let, me, let me do this. Uh -oh. There we go. Um, okay, I guess that's working. Switch to this, oh. and then the so now I have this weird thing where the I'll probably just, no? I think I just do this. So there's this, and it doesn't let me minimize it. I don't want to see myself. Okay. All right, I'm going to just, I don't know what's wrong with this tool, but uh, I'm going to turn off the video because um, in the classroom here, when I have the video running, it decided, I guess, last week to start putting a big box over everything that I'm trying to present uh, when I have the video on, and it doesn't let me minimize it anymore. So maybe if I do this and then that, nope, still doesn't. Work. Okay, um, so. I think I have that. I'll go back um, to the beginning of the lecture and we will go from there. So this will be a little bit shorter, but I should have enough time to run through this today. So um, uh, what I was uh, telling the students in the class, and I'll just start off again. Uh, so uh, not everyone in this class um, has probably uh, may have taken assembly language. Uh, so what I will do is I'll have about two lectures that are dedicated to breaking it down. Um, so kind of trying to explain what assembly language is, uh, what the purpose of it is, why that's important for malware analysis. Um, and so um, for s some of you who have had assembly language at either you know on the job or uh, actually took an assembly class or a um, embedded systems class or a microcontroller uh, engineering class or something like that, um, some of this might be old hat for you, but um, you know, for others, hopefully it'll get everyone on the same page. So um, the first <coughs> piece that I'll hit is uh, what is machine language? Um, the top sentence up here is probably like the most important constraint for where it applies to malware analysis. It's that in order to execute software in most of your environments, so on my computer, on my phone, on this little um, tool here that's supposed to allow me to control everything. Um, you know, there was source code that was written um, or there is a program that was written and it's supposed to run uh, code on the machine to control it. Uh, so a great example is uh, the WebEx tool that I've got on here on um, presenting everything. Um, the reason why that one's really interesting is source code was written in Java. It was compiled to Java and so then there's this Java machine that's actually running in the background of my computer that's translating that Java um, assembly language or Java bytecode uh, into my computer's native machine code. So even with Java programs or Flash programs um, or C Sharp programs, um, despite that they have their own bytecode, uh, if some of you are familiar with those things, um, 
at the end of the day, it still needs to be translated into a sequence of instructions uh, that are native to my computer's processor. And the same with uh, JavaScript and things like that too. So I'll say for software development, <clears throat> one of the most common approaches to achieving this is to perform static compilation uh, of source code, let's say from an author, um, that tries to translate it into a static file, an actual file that's target native machine code. So that would be your exe file uh, or your DLL file as we were analyzing in one of the previous classes. So um, this statement here, um, talking about the malware you'll um, encounter, uh, a lot of it tends to still be written in C or C++. Uh, when I wrote this, uh, Delphi was uh, popular. I'll say that I still deal with malware that's written in Delphi, which if those of you aren't familiar with it, it's a, um, it's a derivative of the uh, Pascal uh, programming language that um, I, think, uh, I, I think they're still called Borland, uh, that Borland uh, released. Uh, so it's a popular alternative language. It's got roughly a similar feature set to C or C++ or kind of sits like right about the same level. Um, Frequently, uh, this will be x86 code. So again, um, this is the stuff that you're going to be dealing with in, the, in this class is going to probably fit into one of these two machine architectures. So um, <coughs> I call it uh, the native language for your processor or your CPU, um, and it's typically the most efficient form for your software. So even um, with something like Java, uh, you are still seeing a orders of magnitude performance improvement uh, in an algorithm that's written and executing in native machine code that may have been written in C or C++ over something written in Java and then running in Java virtual machine. Uh, that said, Java is still actually uh, surprisingly efficient for uh, what it is doing under the hood there. Uh, and uh, a lot of people actually do popularly use uh, Java for malware and stuff like that, similar to C Sharp. Um, you know, those properties are one of the reasons why WebEx here uh, that I'm using is uh, written in Java and works. So, um, <clears throat> let's say, uh, give you a bit of a background on CPU architectures. So, among uh, CPU architectures, there's like two predominant um, design models that are used for uh, architecting the CPU. Um, first is load store architecture. Um, so <clears throat> that one is often uh, an architecture that uh, separates the data movement operations very heavily from the data, um, from the arithmetic operations. So if I need to do math, right, um, and I have large table of integers, um, if I'm using a load store architecture, I might need to uh, implement instructions that retrieve all that data into the CPU before then I can perform operations on it. Um, register memory architecture is one that allows me to do, still do that, but then also I can directly uh, run math against the in-memory stuff as well if I would like to. Um, so the second one of these is what will be commonly what you'll be running into with uh, x86 processors and a lot of the malware that we uh, will be analyzing. So, uh, but in both cases, you know, at an architectural level, the computer is divided into uh, the system memory and CPU registers. So uh, those of you who aren't familiar, the processor itself has some basic, what amounts to high speed local memory uh, built into it. And uh, that ends up being very small amount. Um, it's not to be confused with the cache. Uh, for those of you who buy, uh, maybe build your own system or whatever, might see the cache number on there. That's not the uh, memory that I'm talking about. Uh, there's actually uh, CPU registers, which is local data storage. Um, so for the load store architecture, typically you run into a situation where any operation, any mathematical operation and things like that, um, need the data to be located in the registers before it can actually work on it. Um, and then memory ends up being something, you know, it's uh, gigs in size uh, or gigabytes in size that all of your data can live in. So again, uh, the CPU itself, um, I'll say that one of the other big constraints with it is typically only being able to perform operations on very small amounts, maybe two pieces of data, or if you're lucky, three or four. 
uh, at one time. So uh, the other thing too is that uh, because the registers end up being a very small data set or a very small uh, data uh, number of data slots, um, they're usually given names. Um, they're, I would say those names are typically analogous to like how you would use local variables in your programs. Um, and if you take the compiler class, you'll actually learn a lot more about how those two concepts really tie into each other. Um, so, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, the processor needs to localize data that it needs to operate on. And this kind of gets into the load store, um, you know, the load store point that I made earlier, where that localization is an architectural requirement. Uh, so, um, for the registered memory architecture, which is the architecture that your processor in your laptop typically uses, um, <clears throat> localizing the data is very difficult because you can't bring all of memory into the processor. That's where the whole presence of cache existing is actually helpful. It allows you to very quickly do a lot of those direct to memory operations, or I should say what seems like direct to memory operations. Uh, so in a nutshell, I'll say that <clears throat> because localizing data is a requirement of this first architecture, you end up having programs that have a lot more instructions in them to do very simple tasks because you end up having to hand write that localization step. Uh, you end up having to hand write, how do I get this out of memory into the processor? So that ends up being operations that you need to put in yourself or that the compiler needs to put in. Um, in the register memory architecture, there's a whole system uh, working inside the processor that actually manages that data movement for you. So the data movement still happens for the most part. Uh, it's just uh, done in such a way that it seems almost uh, invisible to you. Um, and therefore, it ends up being something where you can uh, do almost like higher level operations or more complicated operations in single lines of code. So <clears throat> uh, moving from that, we'll move on to instruction families. So the term instruction is typically what's used to describe one operation in assembly language. So one line of code in assembly language, typically called an instruction. Um, uh, they, <clears throat> atomic operations executed at the machine code level are called instructions. So uh, that's kind of a more formal way of explaining that. Um, there are many of them. So roughly between 900 to 1,000 are implemented on most of the CPUs that you all have on your laptops. Uh, and because that number is so, you know, so high, it's generally very difficult to list them all out. Uh, they usually break them up by uh, into instruction families. I'll say that the families, you know, depending on whose textbook you're using, the grouping and everything like that is very subjective art. Um, I tend to like to give them these four groups um, just because, uh, you know, uh, just out of uh, kind of simplicity and brevity. But um, the first group is arithmetic. So that's going to be all the mathematical operations, um, a lot of the comparison operations. Um, so uh, not just, you know, not just addition, subtraction, but also like and, or, XOR, so all the logical operations, all the bitwise operations, um, but also like the actual comparisons and things like that. Uh, so if you uh, think about the assembly language we were looking at in Ida Free the other day, um, there was, a, I demonstrated where there was like a branching instruction or a jump uh, following a compare operation and uh, how you typically compare two numbers together, which is generally speaking what the x86 architecture is working with for the most part, um, is uh, you can either run like subtraction or you can run a bitwise AND on it uh, to try and see if uh, there's any difference or basically see if the result of that e evaluates to zero or evaluates to a negative number, those types of things to try and determine greater than, less than, you know, equal to, uh, things like that. <coughs> so um, all of those testing instructions or comparison instructions, at the end of the day, really do mathematical operations and they also fit into ar uh, arithmetic. So the next section 
the Max family would be control transfer instructions. Um, I'll say that um, these instruct this family of instructions are the ones that typically modify the instruction pointer, or modify the current uh, program cursor, if you want to put it that way, or the program uh, oh, yeah. depends on the architecture, right? Uh, some some call it uh, um, the IR. Some people call it the PC. It's the program counter or program cursor. Um, but control transfer instructions is where the jump uh, instructions are or the branching instructions are in some architectures. Uh, also the call instruction, so making function calls. Uh, so if you're doing a if statement, uh, if statement can either go to the true block or the fault or you know or the else block, right? Um, you know there's a jump instruction, uh, usually what's called a conditional jump, which we will get into uh, later on when we dive into those. And that's a control transfer instruction. Um, so then there's also memory transfer instructions. Um, that is moving data from memory to the CPU, or from the CPU to memory, or sometimes from memory to memory if the processor supports that. Uh, so, you know, going up to the load store architecture, you know, those are requirements, so those are built in. There's probably a lot of ways to do it. Uh, but even on the register memory architecture, uh, just moving data around in general, uh, whether uh, you just happen to um, have a more efficient way of doing the data movement for your operation or being for your algorithm than like uh, that kind of behind the scenes logic is doing for the uh, caching logic. Uh, or um, just like you want to move data from one place to another in memory. Um, memory transfer instructions exist in that as well. They just aren't always a requirement for uh, mathematical operations to succeed. So and then finally, there's a group of instructions that we call system instructions. Uh, so some of you who've taken like the cloud computing class um, and have learned kind of at a high level how hypervisors work and everything like that works, um, or those of you who have dealt with, uh, uh, are familiar with enough with like Windows drivers or Linux drivers understand that um, if I am a, um, if I'm a, uh, you know, a normal user of this computer here, um, I shouldn't be able to directly interact with the hard drive hardware, right? I need to go through the operating system. I need to ask the operating system if the operating system can do things on my behalf, or even if they can provide uh, a certain level of access to me to be able to do it on my own. So basically, I need to ask permission. Uh, the way that most processors handle that kind of that logic is through system instructions. So they actually have a number of instructions that are used for governing um, hardware access, or used for governing um, uh, memory management, or used for governing um, uh, virtualization and stuff like that. So virtual CPU management, um, in the case of like hypervisors and things like that, um, those all fall within what I'd consider to be the system instruction set. Uh, also, there's a large number of uh, system instructions that are suitable for um, suitable for like debugging and suitable for uh, program testing and things like that. Because most processors implement some uh, uh, developer tools in them as well, and so those also fall into the system bucket. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, I'll just kind of throw out some examples. Uh, one system instruction that um, that exists is like uh, in a lot of arch architectures is the, the no op or the no operation um, which uh, <coughs> is usually I think instruction 90 uh, or I should say byte 90 on the x86 architecture and so that's a system instruction that doesn't really have any effect um, but it or I should say it doesn't obviously have any effect the effect that it really has to do is to move on to the next byte so move the instruction pointer for forward without doing anything else. Uh, so another system instruction might be uh, the interrupt instruction, which can cause you to run an interrupt routine or interrupt service routine or something like that. Um, uh, I'd say the other couple ones that the x86 architecture has is a uh, sysenter and sysexit and stuff. So those are ones that allow you to switch into system mode and stuff like that. Um, or they frequently used when uh, you 
having uh, have a need to switch into the operating system kernel for some say driver call. So um, that said, um, because a lot of malware that you're dealing with isn't um, you know, <clears throat> isn't um, expected to run inside the kernel, isn't expected to run at the operating system level, it's usually expected to run at the user level, uh, you may not run into system instructions on a lot of it unless there happen to be some very specifically tailored uh, uh, malware that's intended to do uh, special things like maybe um, you know interact with your hardware in a damaging way or something like that. So a um, great example would be like the Stuxnet malware or something that might have actually you know dealt with it that way. So um, I'd say these represent the core feature set of the CPU uh, for implementing algorithms. Uh, those of you who have taken assembly language and have worked, especially if you've worked in any kind of like multimedia capacity or crypto mining capacity or any of that stuff, um, you're probably keenly aware that there's some other more specialized families in addition to these uh, that I'm not going to jump into, mainly because I don't tend to see a lot of those things. Uh, so things like the vector instructions and stuff like that. I don't tend to see a lot of those in malware, uh, and that's m most likely uh, a consequence of their, you know, um, of them needing special CPU hardware. So those instructions only working on certain CPUs, um, <clears throat> which can kind of narrow the target landscape for a attacker. So um, we'll jump into. Uh, typical compilation sequence. So, um, for anyone who's, you know, used Visual Studio and want to know what's going on behind the scenes when you build a program, or uh, you know, for anyone who hasn't used it for building a C program, uh, literally what you end up doing is you write the application. So you write your code. Uh, you compile that source code into uh, assembly or an assembly language representation. Uh, so usually that C code's translated to assembly. That assembly code is then compiled into binary code, uh, machine code. So in this case, x86 machine code. And then um, all the different um, object files that contain machine code typically end up getting linked together uh, into a exe or DLL. So if you've written a program that ends up having you know, five or six different source code files to it, uh, oftentimes those get converted into five or six different assembly language files and five or six different machine code files. Uh, and then the final stage, and this is the one where, um, if you remember the metadata at the EXE we were looking at, uh, actually had information in it about the linker version and stuff like that. Uh, the tool that was used for this fourth step uh, is the one that kind of links a lot of those objects together into a cohesive program. And then finally, uh, you install it in the target system. So in the case of malware, you end up trying to figure out a way to deliver it to the target system. Uh, so in some cases, um, if you'll remember, we were playing around with that dark comet malware. Uh, in some cases like that, they actually have done, the author of that knows that doing steps one through four is actually a difficult process. So you know, typically, ends up requiring some level of uh, developer competence. Um, many of the malware operators don't want to have to deal with that. Uh, so a lot of times what we will find is that some author will have done steps one through four for us, and then they'll provide an EXE that we can then change the configuration of after the fact. And what tends to happen in that case is that all of the settings that you fill out in the dialog box, like when we were doing that, uh, they end up getting inserted or overwriting existing values in the pre-compiled executable. And this is a really good example of where uh, kind of doing the machine code analysis and everything really helps out uh, because you can build signatures that are trying to identify the characteristics in that pre-compiled EXE that the author has shipped um, without necessarily um, being tied to specific variations that are plugged in by the individual operators. So basically, you know, you open up the opportunity for you to be able to write signatures that can identify all variants, regardless of the embedded configuration. 
So, <clears throat> um, and the final piece, again, with a lot of these, like pre so using the pre-compiled code example, without some sort of emulation support, compiled software will frequently only run on machines and OS versions that it was built to be compatible with. And um, you know, this is the case for most of the EXEs, most of the DLLs. Um, I will say for Java applications as well, this, is, this also applies for most Java applications. Um, from the point of view of Java, um, the machine is whatever version of Java that you happen to be using, and then the OS version ends up being uh, specific uh, libraries and st specific runtime libraries that would have been shipped with Java uh, that you aren't delivering yourself. Um, so for instance, um, though they try to make it the case, uh, it is common to find programs that were written for a newer version of Java that won't run in an older version of Java and vice versa just because of the uh, shift in features and also the changes in the uh, virtual machine language. So uh, the same is true with uh, Windows as well. Uh, most of the time, uh, most Windows programs are intended to work across all versions from Windows NT on up. Uh, but very often, you'll run into situations where a program that was written for Windows XP, or I'll say Windows 10, uh, will be missing something if it's trying to run on a Windows XP system unless you also ship that piece uh, that's missing. So, <clears throat> um, the reason I kind of point this out is that this, knowing this, knowing that this may, all, uh, may often be the case, is going to be very helpful on trying to do the dynamic analysis piece, trying to figure out, say, what, um, how you need to configure your malware analysis lab environment if you'd like to try and execute this program to see how it behaves. And <clears throat> sometimes that information is present inside the executable. Other times, you actually need to do some malware analysis to try and figure out, um, for instance, uh, trying to identify which of the functions need to be present in the DLLs. Um, we looked through uh, with OBJ dump some time ago. We looked through the, uh, the EXE. I think I might actually have a, a great example for you too. So let me see. Yeah, so I'll just do this one right. So um, I'll go up here. So this one right here, this kernel32.dll. Uh, um, this particular um, this particular program has a requirement that it will only run on a version of Windows that has this DLL present, which is most versions of Windows, and then the DLL needs to be a version that, for instance, has maybe this function present in it, which may be an even narrower set of versions of Windows. So there might be some earlier version of Windows that doesn't implement this, you know, uh, API um, on which this program may fail. And that version of Windows, or I should say, a, um, you know, a variable in this program or metadata in this program that says I will only run on this version or higher, that may not actually be present or that might be false. So this is another way, you know, this is one of the ways where you would use malware analysis to try and enumerate, say, what functions are being used by this program so that you can identify which version of Windows should it run on by trying to find out which versions of Windows have the highest overlap or have a 100% overlap with um, API calls that it's making. So, you know, uh, this would be another example. Um, so this one might actually be, because I think this API is actually uh, not, this is a much newer API, right? So this URL mon.dll um, has to exist in order for this program to work. So, that also allows you to identify, say,
um, what uh, systems in your environment might be, say, susceptible to a particular piece of malware. So um, <clears throat> I kind of, um, because I jumped into the IDA Pro stuff, you actually already saw this piece um, uh, set up. I will say that the process of building a control flow graph, which is what that's called when you have the different blocks of assembly code, and then you have the graph edges that are kind of interconnecting them and showing where the code paths go. Uh, that's typically called a con control flow graph. Um, so step one up here when you're writing the application, you are, um, <coughs> you are writing uh, your program. You're inserting all sorts of conditions in there with if statements and while statements, and um, you're implementing call statements and things like that. Uh, the compiler is actually going to use those statements to identify how to break your program up into discrete blocks of code. And um, what they'll do is they'll look for long sequences of non-control transfer operations. So if you remember, we broke the instruction families up like this, right? This is one of the key reasons why you break the instruction families up like this, um, is that then uh, you can basically say if or while the instruction's not a control flow instruction, then just keep adding it to the current block. Once you get to a control flow instruction, then you need to create maybe two blocks. And then you need to start adding from those points on all the instructions that follow them until you get to another control flow instruction and you know and on and on and on basically build out a program graph so the compiler does that one of the neat things that happens when we're doing malware analysis is that we're actually trying to reconstruct that so that we can find out where this program goes and what it does and so <coughs> you know that's uh so this is basically how this approach happens i think on this slide i cover some of the um kind of ideas from the compiler side of it the big thing is that when your source code's broken up, then those um, are very often, those statements are actually compiled as discrete blocks. So the blocks themselves end up having the assembly language representation. And then all of those are stitched back together before it's sent to uh, convert your assembly language, or basically before it's sent to assemble it. So um, I have some uh, references here, resources here, uh, that are you know, that are all hyperlinks or whatever. So uh, when I get this stuff um, up there on the class site, uh, you'll have access to all these things. Um, I'll say that, what is it? The AMD 64 programmer's reference, even though it's the 64-bit programmer's reference, it actually covers both the 32-bit and 64-bit ones. Uh, little known fact, the 64-bit instruction set that's on most of your computers is actually the one that AMD proposed back in the late 90s or early 2000s or something. Um, Intel at the time wanted to create a brand new architecture that was 64-bit that was uh, completely revolutionarily different. Um, that did not go very well uh, and then they decided to just adopt the one that AMD designed uh, which was really just a a uh, slight modification on top of the existing x86. Oh, great. Um, but uh, these are all great uh, resources. Uh, if any of you happen to find uh, any more x86, um, basically uh, assembly language resources that you find very helpful, because uh, I'll say that I kind of come at this from the perspective of having written and read assembly language for a very long time, so all these things make sense to me. It would be very helpful for me to hear from uh, anyone in class if you have anything that uh, maybe was very helpful on learning much more recently. Um, so a lot of times, one of the other things that's neat too uh, that I found is that um, you can either, you can request either print or electronic copies of the instruction sets for CPUs you're working with. So uh, we won't cover a lot of this stuff in this class, but as I mentioned earlier, um, if you're working with industrial control systems and embedded systems and things like that, um, even if it's something that's um, ARM processor based, um, 
those systems are processors that aren't anything, that usually aren't anything like your PC uh, processor. Um, because of that, they don't have always a huge amount of open source documentation on the internet about them. Uh, many of the CPU vendors, especially for a lot of embedded systems and a lot of very application specific systems, um, many times are more than happy to share with you all the technical documentation about their assembly language. So if you find yourself having to do some analysis to figure out if uh, you know an embedded system was compromised or something like that, or embedded system was damaged uh, in you know your job environments, uh, find out the CPU even possibly by opening up the device, uh, and uh, you might actually be able to get in touch with the manufacturer and actually get those um, uh, instruction set documents and maybe even some other developer docs as well. <coughs> so uh, we'll jump into a quick. Um, example program in C, right? So, um, but I'll jump off the uh, I'll jump off the display here because uh, this is prepared for the slide. I actually have a commented version of this that uh, whoops, is it C, yeah. So I actually have a version of this um, that I've annotated. So that I put comments in. <clears throat> so um, you know, first of all, all programs have an entry point, and the entry point is often named main uh, in most systems. So the main function. And this is even a convention that's used all the way up to Java and everything. Um, so the main function is where you first want to go uh, to try and figure out, you know, what the program does. Um, and so I actually just have it doing very simple things. What it does is it spits out a message saying this is the beginning of the program, and then it runs a function and returns whatever the return value of that function is. And that function's right up here. So. Uh, this function, in a nutshell, what it will do is uh, it'll start off with i being 0, b being 4, uh, and then it sets i to 0 again for whatever reason. Um, and then, <coughs> basically, this is, a, this is shorthand for a while, so this could very easily be, um, you know, while i is... Uh, less than 45 um, do the code, but I just happen to use 4 to try and illustrate um, yeah. illustrate that you can uh, use a lot of those interchangeably to some extent. So, But the idea here is that um, the 4 instruction itself, or, or the 4 um, keyword, the 4 operation itself, uh, is a control flow operation. So uh, it's actually a combination of two things. What it's doing is it's testing whether this clause is true, so whether i is less than 45. And if it is, then it jumps to here or it proceeds to here. If it's not, then it jumps all the way down here. So that's an example of control flow operation right there. So, so it gets down here. We'll say, well, i is less than 45. And then what it does is it runs the uh, modulo division operation, or the remainder operation, if you want to call it that, um, on 2 uh, against i. So it tries to see if i mod 2 is not equal to 1. Does anyone know what this test is really doing in kind of English language? Yep, there you go. So it is trying to test if i is an odd number. Uh, because there is no operation on the CPU that says, you know, is it odd or is it even? You don't have an is odd or it is even in the processor. You have to break down that um, test or that concept into mathematical terms. So how we do that is we divide i by 2, and then we try and see if the remainder of that is 1 or 0. <coughs> 
If it's zero, then that means i is divisible by two, which means odds an even number because or i is an even number because um, all even numbers are divisible by two. Uh, if the remainder is one, then uh, i is an odd number. So in this case, it says that not equal to one, which means that this branch right here happen, executes if it's even. So if i is even, then you do these three things. Otherwise, if i is odd, then you jump down here and you start doing these two things. I think I might have, I might have this logic backwards, but yeah. So um, I think the reason I have it backwards is the last time I did the uh, test. Uh, here you go. So this is also another very interesting thing, right? Um, whoops. <clears throat> so I'll leave it at this. I'll leave it at this for a moment. Is that um, because I was uh, I think the last time I was in the source code file, I was trying to demonstrate uh, something. Is that um, this is a really good example of it, you really may just want it to run these two operations for some reason, right? Um, if it does the logic wrong, does it really matter? from the perspective of I'm running the program, the program runs to completion and all that stuff. If I'm doing the operation wrong, does it really matter? And I'd say, it doesn't really matter as long as it doesn't break anything. And this is where you get into characteristics that the software developer or the malware author can introduce or uh, uh, logic bugs that the, lo that, the, um, that the malware author can introduce that are not necessarily a catastrophic failure, but will be interesting. Because in this case, the fact that this operation is reversing the even and odd cases, um, that will probably be a, um, what is it? Uh, that will probably be a habit that's not very uh, common, right? That will probably be more likely the exception than the true case. So if I was trying to identify uh, or build a signature, build a way to detect um, this algorithm with this flipped logic here, then I would be able to have like a high rate of recall and very low amount of noise uh, if I'm trying to dig through, say, all, you know, a whole bunch of malware that implements an algorithm like this. Because the author of this program actually made a kind of logical reversal or logic reversal in there that was not you know, how the uh, program was initially supposed to run. However, if I was to switch it this way and then uh, implement the algorithm as it was intended to be, uh, then I would end up having an algorithm that matches a lot more of what would be the common implementation of this, the, the intended implementation of it. Uh, so looking for little bugs like that uh, is definitely a big piece of doing uh, malware analysis. Well, luckily, we get to deal with like the C source code right here. Um, but that's not always the case. A lot of times you have to deal with the disassembly. So whoop, I'm going to do this. And I'll do the compilation stages. So typically, what ends up happening is I end up doing this right? to basically make a asmprobe.o. So there's, you know, something there. And now, let me see, I can't remember if I can use this or not. If not, I can, uh, yeah, I can't. Uh, can I do that? Yeah, so this. There we go. So I turned that program into an object file. And the object file just has the uh, assembly language. Um, and then uh, using that, um, it's actually going, you know, uh, it, it's not an executable program. This part of the reason I did this is just to kind of show you the, um, the nice thing is that this is the code that is, or that makes up, this is the assembly language that makes up the code that I wrote. So now, and I can see uh, WebEx is a little behind. Now, if I do like 
So I, I ran it again, right? Um, I ran OVG dump again, but I ran it on the executable that was linked together. What that's done is it has actually thrown a whole bunch of other junk in here, right? So I have like this libc csu init. Here's my main function. So the main function is in here, but it actually has a few other things added as well uh, that weren't um, that weren't in the original one. Uh, so you know, here's the one, or whoops, here's this one up here, right? Um, and then here's the one down here. Uh, here is that do the thing function. Then here's this frame dummy function, whatever that does. Um, you know, destructors, you know, <clears throat> and then start, right? So what you're seeing here is the um, conversion of the program from my source code and then my machine code. And finally, it's ending up in a executable program that the Linux operating system, most Linux operating systems, um, will actually be able to uh, execute. And uh, what that means is that the code as I wrote it actually needs a whole bunch of other code that comes from the, in this case, the GCC build environment. So GCC actually throws in a whole bunch of code. And if you want, you can like, we'll just do the like really real cheap heuristic of a uh, line count, right? So there's 230 lines in the executable one and 61 lines in mine which means that, you know, roughly, uh, you know, we'll just round up to 240 and say that roughly 25% of the program is the code I wrote. 75% of the program is the code that the authors of GCC wrote, or the authors of uh, the standard C library for, um, this, you know, for Linux wrote. Um, so that, you know, that outcome is definitely something else that's worth keeping in mind when you're doing malware analysis because you are gonna to have to figure out ways to try and stitch out what code it is in this large blob that the author wrote. Because you also don't want to spend a large amount of your time analyzing something that GCC inserted in there that GCC is gonna insert into any executable that a person writes and compiles with that version of GCC. And there's a, we'll go over some strategies on how to attack that problem, but uh, keeping in mind um, how the software build process works and all the components that go into it and everything like that uh, is extremely important and extremely critical when you're dealing with this uh, analysis at the assembly language level. So <clears throat> we will go to uh, this one again just to take a look at it and I'll say that uh, if I go down here, what I can see is that there's a jump instruction right here that's an unconditional jump that goes to number 89, which is like down here. Um, jump if, so this is fun too. So there's a unconditional jump. Now remember how I built this program in the first place. Um, let me uh, let me do this just to help it run out, right? So I'm gonna um, well, I'll just actually do it this way. Gvm uh, this some probe dot c, right? Uh, so yeah, we can see that on the projector decently enough. Um, and this is another interesting thing that uh, you tend. I'm glad it actually did this. So this, for whatever reason, the first thing, it, or one of the first things it does when it gets into the, um, uh, when it gets into the program uh, is, I'll do these three right here. One of the first things it does is it actually does these three assignment steps. So it does, it assigns one variable to zero it assigns another variable to four, and then it assigns the first one to zero again. And then, instead of jumping into this for loop thing, it actually unconditionally jumps all the way to the bottom, to, or, whoops, to this line right here, to perform the comparison. So to perform that test against um, 
45, which evaluates to uh, 2C in hexadecimal. So this right here, this line that's all the way near the end of the file, or end of the function, is actually this line that I wrote all the way up here. So also trying to piece apart how those constructs turn into assembly language is not always intuitive. And um, I always, it, I always like, I'm, you know, on my side, I'd be in the habit of trying to do this type of approach, which is make a really simple program, um, and then try and compile it. Sometimes after you get good at reading assembly language, you'll start to pick up, um, you know, you'll start to be able to visualize what algorithm they're trying to implement if they're trying to do something that's very common, like RC4 or a TEA or something like that. Um, and you'll be able to actually implement the algorithm more or less their way and then fiddle with the compiler, fiddle with the, um, with, like in this case, where I have the black arrow up there, um, that's a for statement, but it could easily have been written as a while statement. See if that changes how the code actually compiles and that type of stuff. Uh, and then you can try and figure out um, maybe what C code or what maybe some variant of the C code that the author wrote would have looked like. So, um, but it does that and then it jumps all the way back up to this location which is 1F. So we'll go up here and lo and behold, that happens to be the next line. So it jumps all the way down, does the test. If the test succeeds, then it jumps all the way back up. So so we'll jump back in here. So this is the, the more the condensed or concise version of that program. Uh, you can see that uh, when I wrote the code the first time, I wrote it correctly, so I'm not crazy. But, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> it was kind of nice that I left that in there because uh, it illustrated kind of the point of, uh, you know, looking for weird almost um, oddities or mistakes that the programmer might have done. Uh, those things can very commonly uh, allow you to kind of get an edge when you're trying to explain what patterns to look for, what uh, content to look for. So uh, the other thing that I put together, I don't know, uh, this looks very nice on the WebEx, but uh, let me see if I can zoom in a bit on the screen and uh, if that helps. So this um, is more or less uh, the code, right? And um, so like I was saying, here's that do the thing function. Um, <clears throat> I will say that I compiled this on old version of Ubuntu, so my apologies if it's not exactly one-to-one -one with what I was showing you, but it looks pretty close. Um, and then here's that jump. So what I ended up doing in this case um, was I took those, um, you know, I actually ran this through a, um, here, I'll just do this, right? Um, this is actually a good uh, a good test. So I had compiled it to an object file, and then I used OBJ dump. You can also do I think this, and then that ends up giving me this, which is the disassembly. So uh, just like I was saying. Uh, you can compile from C, or whenever you compile from C to binary, what it does first is it translates to assembly language, and then it translates the assembly language to machine code. So it does it breaks it up into multiple steps. Um, this right here is me just telling the compiler with the dash S flag, uh, don't do the machine code phase, just stop after the assembly. So, um, and that um, that output there you'll see that one of the neat things is that when that happens, rather than giving a finite address, they actually put a uh, label there for you. So they give you a generic label. And so that, uh, if you're curious, is where I'm getting the labels that are used here. So the label that's used here and up there and right here in the, uh, you know, these things. So uh, this is me manually putting together the program graph uh, based upon um, that assembly language. So the other thing that's neat um, <clears throat> is that 
in the main function, it doesn't actually have any edges coming out of it. Um, and that um, that's more kind of my personal preference when I'm trying to represent these things. So the way I see the call instruction, which that's a function call, right? Uh, so it might be easier if I go back here to the, uh, um, to the C code. Uh, so anytime that you call a function, we'll go up here to one of these printf statements. Uh, what it ends up doing is it steps to this line, right? And then it does whatever this function does, which could take days, could take seconds, could take milliseconds. But um, always, whenever you run a function like this, either the program never returns for whatever reason, or the program eventually steps to the next line, which would be this one, the do the thing uh, function. So um, I always like to try and look at these, um, look at a lot of these things as kind of like ab abstract concepts. Uh, so in this case, um, the function itself, or the call instruction itself, is really just trying to provide a mechanism to the author or to the programmer to be able to implement their own instructions to some extent. You know, a lightweight, um, lightweight way to explain it is that. So when I think about it that way, then I basically treat them as non-control flow instructions, mainly because they themselves don't really change the program flow they just go and execute another block of code and wait for that block of code to finish before it comes back. Uh, so um, the reason I bring a lot of the, the reason I bring this up is because uh, you will deal with some code analysis tools and like Ida Free, um, and I believe Ida works this way, uh, which is that Ida won't draw any graph edges for function calls like that. Ida will treat them as if they were just like a inline non-control flow instruction like this. Uh, and so uh, where possible, where I need to go and represent that, I'll take the same approach. Uh, there are other analyzers out there, and it's one of those subjects where everyone has their own different opinion. It depends upon what you're trying to convey with the visualization. Uh, so in some cases, you may run into ones which do add uh, edges from the call instruction to go to the function. But in this case, it didn't, and that's why main looks kind of like it's orphaned up here, is that um, the graphs that we're trying to construct here are literally just the graphs of the different function paths. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> let me zoom this back out. So, typically with malware, and you know we messed with this earlier, the program source code isn't uh, isn't available. So. Um, it's necessary to use these tools, and this is one of the big pieces of malware analysis, why tools like IDA were designed, and there's a number of other ones as well. Um, <coughs> some cases, they may even help um, convert some or all of the disassembly into um, possibly readable C program code. Uh, so this IDA tool, um, if you buy the paid version of it, and then you also pay for an upgrade, uh, there's a plugin that will take the graph that you're looking at and will actually try and convert it into a C program. Uh, if you don't want to pay thousands of dollars, and a lot of people don't, um, this tool, Snowman, is actually really good. Um, it's not as good as Ida, but it's pretty good. Um, I'll say that one of the things that Ida specializes in is trying to identify cases where executable code is buried inside of a program in a way that um, it's not obvious that it's linked up to the normal executable code. So for instance, programs that modify their memory space after they've been loaded, like at runtime, um, some of those approaches are able to be unwound with Ida um, but with some of the other tools that take a more straightforward approach, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and so Snowman, I believe, is one of the ones that will literally try and do what the follow the code path that the program says is its true code path, uh, regardless of whether it is or not. Ida will try and find basically hidden code. 
uh, or I'll say code that looks like it's a long sequence of executable instructions. Um, and uh, we'll get into, I think in the next class, uh, some of the reasons why you can build heuristics to discern between whether a large blob of data is likely executable code or not uh, without having any sort of uh, connect uh, any sort of metadata in there. Uh, but I now actually have a large number of heuristics that try to discover those things. Uh, a tool like Snowman does not. That said, Snowman uh, generates some like, I'd say some decently readable C code and uh, you know, uh, and that is definitely very helpful from the perspective of a free open source tool. So it can also be improved as well. Um, but I'm gonna jump back up to the compilation sequence because one of the neat things here is that when you get all the way down here to install on target system, <coughs> that's when you know you have a piece of malware that you're trying to look at that someone said is interesting your job from the analysis point of view is to try and basically walk backwards. So step six is basically a mirror image of step four where you start pulling the executable code out of the malware. And then step seven is step three where you convert the executable, the machine code into an assembly language representation. Um, and you just, uh, you try and reconstruct that control flow graph uh, and again, um, if you remember when the program was compiled, it took the C code, broke the C code up to the control flow graph, then converted each one of those pieces into assembly language, and then compiled them. The neat thing, because it works in that way, when you're reconstructing the program, you can reconstruct the control flow graph just having the assembly without having any of the source code, because the way the compiler worked was to individually convert those um, pieces from source code to assembly after they were built into the graph. Um, so because most compilers work that way, not all of them do, but most do, um, it gives you the ability to, um, it gives you the ability to have, uh, to have that flexibility. So 